All right. So now we have the opportunity to ask questions or to uh, comment on what I've said. Uh, I don't take any complaints, but uh, comments and questions are okay. So uh, please fire away. Uh, good evening. Namo Bande. So I have a question. Mm. Um, I saw your previous video in a YouTube uh -huh. regarding uh, the importance of the Buddha and you talk about the evidence of rebirth in minute 1926. So um. <laughs> you, okay. yeah, you yeah. talk about yeah. that one of the, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. the evidence of why we need to believe in rebirth is because like the Buddha said so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is, yeah. isn't it contradicting with the concept of a basico, <laughs> or am I getting this wrongly? May I yeah. get your clarification? Thank you. Well, yeah, so the, I mean, first of all, it depends on where you are on the Buddhist path, right? So when you start out as a Buddhist, okay, you don't really necessarily expect people to believe in rebirth right away. First of all, you have to get a feeling for who the Buddha was and whether he said anything sensible and all of these kind of things. But after a while, when you get a feeling for the Buddha, and you get a feeling that actually this person is pretty awesome, uh, yeah, pretty kind of amazing, yeah, because that's kind of the feeling of the Buddha. He's really this awesome character. And when you get that feeling for the historical Buddha as a real person who had exceptional qualities, uh, then it's natural to pay some, play some confidence and faith in what he says, uh, right? Uh, if the Buddha really existed in this way, if the Buddha had these qualities, uh, and he said so many wise things, if he said there is rebirth, uh, of course, I should have some faith in that. It kind of makes sense. So it depends on where you are on the path, yeah? whether you, how much faith and confidence you have in it. And that is really only the beginning. And of course, then you, even though you have confidence and faith in what he said, you also realize, actually, you don't know. There's a difference between confidence and actually knowing. So then, based on that confidence, then you practice the path. You use that confidence to spur your practice to motivate you. Then you practice the path. And as you practice the path, then, of course, things gradually become more clear. Yeah? Stage by stage becoming clearer until one day it does become ehipasiko. Like, wow, the Buddha was right. And, of course, when you see that he is right, it becomes much, much more powerful. Yeah? So, but remember that faith is one of the... Uh, spiritual faculties on the Buddhist path. Yeah? Faith is really important, or call it confidence. Sometimes confidence is a better word because faith has kind of many downsides in certain ways. Call it confidence. Just like you have confidence in your teacher when you go to school. The teacher says one plus one is two, you think, yeah, probably right, that makes sense. Yeah? I, can deal with, I can deal with that. So when the Buddha says there's rebirth, yeah, actually, I would say even more, more reason to have faith than uh, the teacher who says these kind of ordinary things. Uh, thank you, Bhante. Um, that was very interesting. I had a question before I came for this talk. Mm -hmm. So I think I still want to share the question, though the talk has kind of uh, clarified some, some little All right. there. Yeah. Uh, we're obviously preaching to, to, to everybody who's kind of like along the Buddhist path. But if I speak to somebody who's outside of this room, say, of another faith, if you like, of another belief, mm. and you say, right view, then the guy say, my view is also right. Well, what makes you so sure your view is right and my view yeah. is not right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know? Get me? So, yeah. so I was just wondering, where, what is the limit, uh, sorry, what is the limit test, like in the chemistry, you know, the yeah. limit test for right view? You did touch on a few things. Yeah. So, so you know, how do we talk to people outside of this room? Say that my view is right. Yeah, don't talk too much to those people outside of this room. <laughs> <laughs> Because usually, usually this leads to more problems and more, more delusion or whatever. I, I, you know, one of, I think one of the, uh, the things is that uh, trying too hard to convince others always kind of leads to problems, yeah? Because people's views are often very strong, yeah? and especially around, around religious things, yeah? People are born with a certain religion, born with certain ideas, and it's very hard to convince them otherwise. Yeah? These are very, very powerful things. Yeah? Uh, 
but how do you know that the Buddhist view is right and maybe the Christian view is, 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 is right? Which one, how, how do we decide on these things? Uh, and it's basically you just, have to, you just have to kind of inform yourself what makes sense. Yeah? You have to inform yourself about which scriptures make the more, more sense to you. And I, I, to, uh, when I came to the Buddha's teachings, uh, I came to something that held together that overall had a certain consistency, had a certain coherence, had a certain, all the various parts fitted into a larger picture. And there wasn't really anything discordant in the Buddhist teachings. I mean, if you want to, for example, if you want to uh, justify violence, you can't justify that from Buddhist scriptures. It's impossible. Yeah, this is what I mean by integrity in Buddhism. Yeah, it is impossible. But if you, if you were... Yeah, it is this feeling that if I can, thank you so much, uh, if I can convince another person, uh, then we feel that our own view is somehow strengthened. Yeah, then we get more confidence in our own view. Uh, but we need to kind of, I think, get away from that. We need to be able to trust our view without actually convincing others, without having to debate these things. Uh, and uh, that is really kind of the, uh, uh, that is where we can kind of live at peace much more with, uh, with our own views. Uh, but uh, to me, the Buddhist teaching has always been really unique. Yeah, there's some there's certain things about the Buddhist teaching that make them really stand out in the, in the world. One of them is that it is a naturalistic teaching. Yeah. By naturalistic, I mean that everything in Buddhism is within nature. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing outside of nature in Buddhism. Yeah. And so even when we talk about things like rebirth and kamma and enlightenment and these kind of things, uh, things that appear uh, to be... They are extra to what we normally see in the world. They are still within the natural, uh, the nature of things, right? They still belong to nature in a certain way. If there is rebirth, it is a natural principle in the world. But uh, many other religions, what they do, they will say that some things are outside of nature. Yeah, a typical example will be the idea of God. God stands outside of nature, and then he creates the world outside. And that, to me, is kind of... Uh, problematic, yeah, because uh, if something stands outside of nature, uh, then how can you possibly know about it? Uh, how can you have any proper understanding of that thing? Uh? So one of the beautiful things about Buddhism is that it is fundamentally naturalistic. Everything belongs to the larger idea of what nature is like. Yeah? So this to me is very, very important. Another idea which makes Buddhism very beautiful is that it is a universal religion. Uh? It is a religion that kind of works across boundaries, across countries. It is not a religion which is kind of a, a covenant or a deal between a people and their god. Yeah, it is not... Uh, most religions in the world, they tend to be kind of a certain people, they have a certain god, and it's kind of a deal between the god and their people. Buddhism, from the very outset, uh, was a universal religion. Uh, it was given to humanity as such. <laughs> so, uh, when the Buddha started to teach, yeah, he gave the, the very first thing that he gave was the Dhamma Chakka Pavatthana Sutta, for example. Uh, he says that he's setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. And the wheel of the Dhamma, this idea, is the teaching that kind of goes out into the world. Uh, and it rolls on. This is why the idea of the wheel, yeah, it rolls on. It has a certain momentum in our society. It rolls on from one era to another era, from one culture to another one. So from the very beginning, the Buddha had this idea that this teaching would spread out. And so he gave it this kind of universal sense, yeah, this universal application, it applies to all of humanity. It is not just kind of a small religion that arises in a particular place at a particular time. It is universal from the very beginning. Yeah. And to me, any real spirituality should be universal. Yeah. It should not be a religion that applies to a particular people at a particular time. It should apply to everyone. That is the right kind of religion, which to me actually makes sense. Yeah. The third thing about Buddhism, which is really interesting, is that, uh, is it really a religion, right? This is another kind of interesting topic for a talk. Yeah. What do we mean by religion? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it depends what we, how we define these terms. Uh, but to me, essentially, what Buddhism is, uh, it's a kind of psychology. Yeah. It's about learning how to think about things in the right way, how to develop our minds. Yeah, it is how to use our minds, really. And everything ends up with insights, and that insight happens in the mind. So in a sense, it is a psychology. 
does it have certain religious aspects? Well, it depends on how you how you practice your Buddhism. Yeah, some people, some Buddhists are very religious, uh, but uh, uh, in a sense, in a very large part, it comes down to this idea of being a psychology. This brings us back to my first point that it is naturalistic. Yeah. It deals with nature, the way things actually are. Our minds are part of nature, right? Part of the larger world. So this, to me, are some of the things that makes Buddhism unique. Another thing that makes Buddhism really unique and nice is the fact that the Buddha was a human being. Yeah, the leader of our religion is a human being. Isn't that great? I think that is such a wonderful thing because it means that we can relate to the founder of these teachings. We can go to the Buddha, we can ask him questions. Do you, how often do you ask the Buddha questions? How, how, how do you ask the Buddha questions, right? Well, the, what you do is, well, the Buddha is not available, so you can't really ask him first, but you can go to the suttas, yeah? That's how you ask the Buddha questions. So you read the suttas, suttas okay, be kind, be nice, okay, 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 thank you, Buddha, thank you, Master, okay, <laughs> good, okay. Yeah, this is how you ask the Buddha questions. And so we have access, still have access to this thing, but the fact that the Buddha is human makes the teaching very powerful because it means that we have a relationship with the Buddha as you have with another human being. Yeah? And that is far more natural than to have a relationship with like some supernormal thing, yeah? Because that supernormal thing, do they understand us? Do we just have to kind of pray all the time because they are so superior? Well, you know, how does that work? It's kind of a bit dicey. Yeah? But if it is a human being, we know what we're dealing with. Uh, that's kind of beautiful. Uh. So Buddhism is kind of very different from almost any other kind of religion. Uh. It has all these aspects that you don't really find anywhere else. Uh. And so if you are a Buddhist, it's almost like you can't really believe in anything else because it actually is so separate from all other things. Uh. So uh, <laughs> I, I always have this really weird feeling, why isn't everyone a Buddhist? Uh? You know what I mean? How come isn't the, why isn't the whole world a Buddhist? Isn't that kind of obvious? Everyone should be a Buddhist. To me, it's bleeding obvious. Yeah. Why would anyone believe anything else? And this is kind of what I find really hard to understand. But uh, you know, then I'm probably a bit uh, thick, stupid, perhaps. But uh, anyway. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, so maybe we can have some other questions as well. So please, yeah. Aha. So should we take this question first? Uh, yeah? Okay, so does the right view involve the five precepts? Well, um, the right view is the uh, understanding that um, I think if you hold the thing in the middle, uh, Niwern, uh, if you hold the thing in the middle rather than on the end, uh, if you're ho holding at the end is the problem. Uh, hold it in the middle instead, uh, yeah, higher up. Yeah, that's it, the right view, yeah. <laughs> I've had, the deal, had to deal with these things before, so I think, anyway. So is the five precepts, is that right view? And the answer to that is that uh, you can say the right view is the fact that if you live morally, it leads to results, right? It has good results. This is kind of the right view of karma, basically. So it has good results, that's the right view. Yeah, and uh, so in that sense, it is. But the five precepts is just, remember, it is just an abstraction of a larger idea that to be kind and to live well and not to do bad things uh, yeah, is really what morality is about. Uh, and the five precepts is just kind of a very particular example of that. But it's important to broaden that out uh, and to just live a general life of kindness in general. Uh, yeah. Good evening, uh, Venerable Ajahn. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is, um, you mentioned that um, the future is created in how we live in this moment yeah. and we don't have to solve all of the world's problems. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing and the, and the sense that I get is that um, we just focus on ourselves and live and, and, and have the right view and live a good life. But sometimes I feel that is me against the world and it can be very tiring it can be a lot of hard work so how can i build resilience okay and 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 avoid burnout what, what do you mean by you against the world in what sense is it against the world mm, meaning meaning okay. to say that when i try to um live with the right view but there are so many distractions so many temptations okay. yeah. Yeah. and yeah. 
it's me against the world. Yeah, okay, I see what you mean. Right? Yeah, yeah. So well, the, the first thing is to you know understand that uh, uh, even though the world is out of control, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't care. Yeah, this is the first thing. We should not be selfish. Being selfish, in fact, is one of the defilements. Uh, so we should do our best to help out. Yeah, we should understand that. Uh, by caring, by helping out, uh, we are actually living morally because we are kind to others and we care about the state of the world. So we should do things to help out in this way. And if we do that in the right way, we're actually building up our own morality anyway, yeah? because you are caring, you're doing the right thing. So actually you are getting spiritual qualities out of that caring for other people in that way. Yeah? So it's always the wrong idea is not to care. That is not what this is about at all. Yeah? But it means that even though you care for other people, even though you want to make the most out of this world, yeah, in, in whatever way, you realize at the end of the day, there isn't, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it's going to go better, maybe it's going to go worse. Right now it is looking pretty bad, yeah, things are kind of heading kind of in a strange way. And so because you know that ultimately, even though you do your very best, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so if you take your refuge in that world, by taking refuge, I mean you allow your happiness to depend on that world. That's what I mean by taking refuge in that world. If you allow your happiness to depend on something which is so uncertain, so unreliable, you're kind of really making your own life really terrible. You're kind of becoming very vulnerable to shocks and problems and unreliability and uncertainty and earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes and meteors coming into the atmosphere and blowing up the planet. <laughs> you become vulnerable to all those things. Yeah? These are, I say these things more like metaphors, metaphors for things going wrong. Yeah? I mean, literally it might be true as well, but certainly metaphorically true. And so because of that, you realize that, yes, I do all of these things for the world, but uh, the world problems in the world are not the main issue. The main issue, I need to live well so that I have a good life, regardless of what happens in the world. And the difference is that if you think that the problems in the world are the main thing, then you become one of these angry activists. Yeah, and you go around and you kind of lie down in the middle of the road and saying, yeah, I'm not going to move until you sort out climate change, right? That kind of thing. And you become angry and you do bad things. That is the consequence of thinking that the world is the issue. But if you know that actually the real issue, the real thing I should focus on is the spiritual path. Yes, you do things for the world, but you do it with a good heart instead. You don't do things in anger. You don't do things out of greed, but you do things in a good way that aligns with Buddhist principles. That is the main difference. Yeah? So it is how we do things that really matters, not what we do. And so, yes, you help out the world, but you do it with a good heart. And if you feel that you're starting to get angry, you know you've gone too far. Okay, pull back a little bit. Yeah? Come on a retreat for a while. Chill out. Yeah? And then, then go back and do whatever. Have another cup. No, don't have another cup of coffee. That's, that's my job to have another cup of coffee. <laughs> and that is why, the way you do things. And you are right. That is the first part of your question. The second part of your question is how do you kind of you feel it is you against the world, right? So how can you kind of deal with that? Well, Go to places where you fall into the stream. Yeah, this is why you come to places like this. Because here you don't feel anymore that you are against everyone. Yeah, here you fall in line with everything else. And so to do, to be able to withstand the pressures of the world, one of the most important things is to get have a regular diet of good Dhamma talks. Yeah, that is one of the most important things because those good Dhamma talks will kind of help you to remember what is really important in life. If you hear a good Dhamma talk, you will be inspired. You will feel, yay, this is important, this really matters. And you will go out into the world with renewed courage and you will do all the right things because you know it is true in a very deep sense. This is one of the things I love about being, you know, a disciple of Ajahn Brahm. Sometimes I feel kind of, well, I feel a bit depressed and sad. I don't usually feel very depressed, but sometimes maybe I feel a little bit less than not normal. And then I go and I kind of, Ajahn Brahm, I know Ajahn Brahm is having a cup of tea every day, he has a cup of tea at six o'clock. Yeah, he does exactly the same thing every single day. Very predictable in that sense. Uh, two and a half spoons of sugar, five and a half minutes tea bag in the cup, or something like that. I ask him when it comes, it's very kind of specific. And so I go down, yeah, kind of, things not going so well. So I just go down 
And I kind of sit next to Ajahn Brahm there because I'm quite a senior monk as well, so I kind of get to sit very close to Ajahn Brahm. But it's a good idea to be a senior monk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then I just sit there, and I just kind of imbibe the vibe. I, I, the juju, the juju. I imbibe the juju, yeah. And uh, it's kind of beautiful. And this is the power of Dhamma coming from, you know, certain people who have certain qualities, yeah. And you feel the qualities in your bones when you are together with people like that. Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons I love actually being with Ajahn Brahm, because he has all these qualities, and it picks you up. You should do the same thing. And the way for you to do that is to listen to Dhamma talks. Not too often. Some people listen to too many Dhamma talks. <laughs> it's true, you know. I, my good friend Bhante Sujato, who is a very prolific translator, uh, he has this, uh, this website called suttacentral.net, which I've shown that those of you who are on retreat, where all the suttas are translated. And there's also a discourse platform where you have discussions about the suttas, right? Uh, and you can start the discussion, so you have like the heading of the discussion. One of the headings was, Yous are listening to too many Dhamma talks. That was, the, that was kind of the heading, right? And some people, they listen to Dhamma talks as a kind of entertainment or something like that. Always have a Dhamma talk in the background yeah, while they're washing the dishes, listening to the Dhamma. They're not really listening to Dhamma, right? They're kind of hoping that something will enter them by osmosis yeah, while they're listening to these things. But the Dhamma is so precious that when we listen to it, we should really listen. We should kind of be quiet. Maybe we close our eyes and try to understand what is going on. What does this really mean? What is the Buddha trying to say here? How does it affect my life? Taking it in in a deep way. That is kind of the right way to listen to the Dhamma. And then it starts to work. So you need a regular dose of brainwashing. That's what you need. Yeah. And uh, the Buddhist brainwashing is better than most brainwashing. You're going to get brainwashed anyway, so you're going to choose your brainwashing. So there's some brainwashing that doesn't make you stupid, uh, and there are other brainwashing that actually really clean you out properly. Uh, yeah? That's the Buddhist promise. Uh. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn, for sharing um, mm. about right view mm. and... Um, specifically um, focusing on the idea of rebirth. Mm. Um, so my question here mm. is, I'm very curious and interested to, to know um, when you first started out um, to get exposed or searching mm. um, in this area of Buddhism, I mean, obviously you came from a different background being raised and when you were younger, and uh, just like the brothers and sisters here shared that um, it's not easy to face the world when we have a certain understanding, whether it's because it's our past life, we have that um, attraction or, um, or easier understanding of faith um, or curiosity hmm. towards Buddha's teaching. Hmm. But how did, how did you um, navigate all of this? Like, did you just detach and just not talk to these people of your family or your friends <laughs> who have of a different yeah. views? And um, maybe uh, I, I didn't know what you went through, but I'm just curious uh, mm -hmm. because I'm sure some of us would go through that as well. You know, um, we're trying to practice these spiritual practices like meditate more and trying to follow the precepts and things like that. But then we look so odd among the other people who do not practice this. Mm. Now, like, like I've been reading Sutta as well, um, more regularly recently, okay, right? Cool. So my, 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 my question is, is the whole idea to encourage more people to um, practice monastic life and to, to, to be a non-monk uh, or like... Mm. Um, to, to have to understand the Vinaya life as well, right? Is, is that the whole point? I'm so, I'm yeah. so, I'm not confused. I'm just so curious because yeah. it's not really practical for the ordinary people. Like, uh, I read the sutta, like, oh, 400 monks would follow the Buddha to go. We don't have, we don't see, we don't witness mm -hmm. this, especially, especially in the country like Malaysia, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
yeah, I, I, I you know talk too much, but <laughs> I hope it's summarized to exactly. a certain, um, you yeah. know, a, a, a explanation yeah. from you, Ajahn. Thank All you. All right. Yeah, sure. So there's many, many things there, but uh, the, uh, you know, I, I understand that it is difficult yeah, in life because people go in different directions and people have different ideas and you have to kind of withstand everyone else. Uh, and uh, I had the same problem when I wanted to become a monk. My parents were not happy. Yeah, not happy at all. Yeah, my father said to me, "I did not raise you to become a Buddhist monk." Yet, what he said. Of course, he was right. He didn't even know what a Buddhist monk was. So how could he possibly raise me for that? Uh, but that was because he didn't understand. Uh, yeah, he doesn't understand what it is to be a Buddhist monk. And sometimes we have to have uh, the courage of our convictions, the courage of having a view that goes against other people. Uh, and so I said, okay, you know, my father was a very, in many ways, very nice man, very intelligent, and, uh, and had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, inquisitive about the world, all these kind of things. Uh, and, but still, I would say, okay, no, well, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do, uh, and so I do what I want to do. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, and so sometimes you have to, sorry? You let him be unhappy. I, the thing is that, you know, the Buddha has this beautiful simile in the sutta. So this, this is, I don't know if you've read the sutta yet because you said you have read the sutta. So I'm not sure if you've read this one. But I'm going to tell you this one. The Buddha says that sometimes uh, if a child swallows meat uh, and it goes down the wrong, wrong way, so it kind of starts choking yeah, on the meat, uh, then to save the child, sometimes you have to put your finger down the throat, uh, even if you hurt the child, uh, to pull the meat out. Uh. Sometimes you have to hurt people a little bit uh, to for a larger a larger happiness, yeah? And this is true with uh, kind of my family. This is exactly what happened in my family. They didn't understand anything in the beginning. They were concerned about me. They thought I had become a member of some kind of crazy cult that I was going to be brainwashed. And I was brainwashed, uh, but in a good way. So it was okay. And uh, so uh, because of, and so, but what happened, of course, that over time, they started to realize this was a good thing, yeah? And over time, after a while, they started to invite me to do meditation with them. I give Dhamma talks to my family. Yeah, we bring everyone together, my brother, my sister, the in-laws, yeah, their kids, my mother and father, everyone will come. And I will give a Dhamma talk to them. Is that amazing? amazing? Yeah, that's extraordinary. Because and my father told me, this is kind of really extraordinary. My father said to me, I used to be your teacher, now you're my teacher. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> And so sometimes it is worthwhile being a bit stubborn. Sometimes it's worthwhile doing what you know is right because you have a broader picture of what's going on. So don't be afraid of standing out. What you should do, however, you should make sure that you have support in your life to help you with that. That is what the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, the BJF, is about. Yeah? Having Kalyanamitas, people who think like you. That is why you have teachers like Ajahn Brahm and whoever comes here to support you to understand things in the right way. Yeah, this is kind of the point of this. Hang out with more Buddhists. Hang out with more like-minded people. Don't hang out too much with people who uh, make things difficult for you and kind of make, make life hard. This is a very important part of the Buddhist path. This is the idea of the Kalyanamitta, the spiritual friendship. So this is what you have to do. And then as you do these things in this way, then gradually you, you start to be able to live a good Buddhist life. And no, you don't have to become a nun or a monk. Yeah, that is not really required. You're very welcome to become a monk if you like, but you don't have to. Yeah. So uh, I don't provide shaving services here and now, but you know, it can be, can be organized. So the most important thing is just to live a naturally good life, to do the right thing. Yeah? And then if at some point you do want to become a monk and nun, what I would recommend is to go and visit a monastery for a while, hang out for a while, see what it is like, try a few different monasteries, and then you get a feeling for whether that is a good lifestyle for you. But uh, it is not certainly not a requirement. The support here is yeah. minimal in Malaysia. Yeah. Even um, for like where um, mm. uh, Buddhist monks are not really yeah. supported. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. And yeah. I, I'm just curious about this. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is there is a bhikkhuni here uh, called Venerable Sumangala, I think. Uh, who, yeah. Who stays Arya Vihara? Yeah. Yeah. So there is a monastery here which is possible to ordain and to become a you know a real Buddhist nun. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we also have more places in Australia, etc. So, uh, yeah. Whatever.
Good luck. You have to try. Just do your best. Let's see what happens. <laughs> All right.